Okay, welcome back everyone to our second lecture of BC213 on the end times. Um, we are just giving an introduction to uh, the course and um, why it is important to study uh, the end times and how we are going to, uh, what is our approach going to be in studying the end times. Um, any questions so far from anybody? Uh, any thoughts, any questions? Everybody's okay? All right. Okay, thank you. All right, so let's move forward. Um, feel free to ask your questions anytime. Um, so, in our approach to studying the end times, um, the third thing uh, that we want to mention is that we are open yet uncompromising, meaning we are aware that there are various positions in interpreting Bible prophecy, and I will explain um, some of these uh, terms. Uh, we are aware that, uh, that uh, people uh, may interpret Bible prophecy in different ways, uh, and the reason that there are there are, there are so many different interpretations is one having to do with the timing of things, because the Bible doesn't give us a set date and time. Like it doesn't say in the year twenty fifty this will happen, and in the year. 2075, this will happen. It doesn't give us dates, right? So therefore, when it comes to timing, um, there are, you know, the, we can't uh, be hard and fast about it. And therefore, there are people who position things differently. So when it comes to timing, there is difference. And we are aware of that, and we are open to listening to what other people have to say and thinking through on it. And, you know, well, hopefully before, I, you know, I, I, I have thought through on it, and I will share with you reasons for why we position certain things the way we do. And, of course, we are, we are be always open to listening to how others think through on it. And secondly, like we said, uh, when it comes to figurative language in Bible prophecy. Uh, again, there can be variation in interpretation of figurative language. But the rule that we always follow is interpret scripture with scripture. Don't try to interpret scripture by going out of scripture. Right? Um, interpret scripture within scripture. Uh, like if we are going to look at certain things outside, it's okay to look at things outside of scripture, you know, you know, and, and compare it with scripture. But when you're trying to interpret figurative language, interpret it with the rest of scripture. You know, stay within that. So, like I gave you an example where you know in Revelation 12, it was talking about the sun, the moon, the twelve stars, and the the the, the woman. Uh, Instead of, you know, in that same chapter, all of that is interpreted for us. But if we don't stay with that, and then we go outside of it and start looking at, you know, uh, space and stars and astronomy, then we can get into all kinds of weird uh, interpretations. Right? So that's another reason why there are differences in interpretations. One is having to do with timing. Second is having to interpret these the figurative language or uh, things that are given to us, not in certain terms, but in more in figures. Uh, therefore, there are differences. Now, very broadly speaking, when it comes to timing, we have uh, these uh, four, you know, generally speaking, broad categories of uh, positions in interpreting Bible's prophecy, and we will explain each one. There is a dispensational premillennialism. There is historical premillennialism. And there is post 
millennialism and there is a millennialism. So these four broad positions, and we will put it in a little picture so you will understand it. And in or with among this pre-millennialists, um, you have the pre-tribulation, the mid-tribulation, and post-tribulation. Now, some of the meanings you can get it from the word itself, right? Pre-millennial. So pre means before. Millennial is the thousand year, thousand years. So when we say pre-millennial, that means you're saying before the millennium. And this has to do with primarily when people believe Christ will return. Right. So when somebody says they are a pre-millennialist, that means they are saying they believe Christ will return pre, that is before, millennium, meaning the millennium. So when somebody says, I'm a pre-millennialist, they are saying Jesus will return before the millennium. If somebody says post-millennialism, that means they are saying Christ will return post, that is after, millennium is the thousand years. So post-millennial means Christ will return after the thousand years. Now, within, pre, within the pre-millennialists, there is the dispensational and there is the historical. The and this has to do with where you position the pre-millennial return of Christ, before the tribulation or after the tribulation, right? So both are saying Christ will return before the millennium. So both are pre-millennialists. But the where will Christ return? Before the tribulation or after the tribulation? So dispensational pre-millennialism says, these people will position the return of Christ. Of course, pre-millennium is before the millennium, but they will position it before the tribulation. So they are pre-tribulation. Historical pre-millennialism means, so these were, it's called historical because this was what was uh, believed by some, the early church. Early church, I mean, when I say early church, I'm not talking about the first century church, but I'm talking about the church fathers, meaning the second, third centuries. So that's what's called historical premillennialism. And they positioned it post trib. That means Christ will return before the millennium, but after the tribulation. So they are called historical premillennialists. Post millennialism means Christ will return after the millennium. That means a thousand years will go and then Christ will return. And then a millennialist, they don't believe in the millennium being a literal millennium, right? They just believe that it's happening in a spiritual sense. So that, that is explained here in the notes, you know, which I've shared with you. Dispensational premillennialism, historical premillennialism, post millennialism, and a uh, millennialism, right? And if you want to look at it in a chart, like a chart, and uh, we will be referencing this, you know, this this chart. We will use it, um, but look at it here. So, this is the millennium, meaning a thousand, the thousand year reign of Christ, the uh, thousand years. Okay, the Bible talks about thousand years. Jesus ruling and reigning for a thousand years. That's given to us in Revelation chapter twenty and verse four through six. So, Jesus will rule and reign for a thousand years. The Bible says, uh, but now, so that's called the millennium. But now, the so pre-millennialism means before the millennium. So let's say we are in the church age. We are right here now, somewhere here, close to the end of the church age. Now, the dispensational pre-millennialism believe that Jesus will come here. Right? He will come before the seven years of tribulation. Right? So the Bible talks about seven years of uh, tribulation, uh, we will show it from scripture, they believe that Christ will come here. 
historical premillennialism, they believe Christ will come before the millennium, but at the end of the seven years tribulation. So they are basically what we would what people refer to as post tribulation. There are some people who believe in a mid tribulation rapture or Christ coming or take for the church mid tribulation. Uh, that's uh, primarily because of uh, uh, Revelation fourteen, where it talks about the one hundred forty four thousand Jewish believers who would be who are found taken up into heaven, and they are referred to as the first fruits. So. There's an explanation for it, why they believe that. Um, so there are those who believe in the mid-tribulation. The post-millennialism, they believe Christ will return once for all at the end of the millennium. And during the thousand years, it's his reign through the church on the earth. A millennialism, they don't believe in all this. They believe that you know Christ is currently ruling and reigning through the church. And we are in the millennium, so on, and uh, so they they are millennialists. Okay, so these are various positions people take and have taken, and depending on how you read, you know, depending on different books that books that you might read, you will find people taking these kinds of positions, and they will try to explain why they take that position, so on. Now, the position that we take as a church and that i would be taking in this course is what you know a dispensational premillennialism which is a pre-tribulation rapture of the church right? so that's the position we will take and but like i said we are open uh, we are aware that uh, there are other positions and we will try to maybe explain you know okay why do these people say a mid tribulation why do these people say end of tribulation etc I mean, we'll mention those things along or and if you're interested you can always uh, research that that the position we will be taking in this course and you're free to you know disagree or whatever i mean we are not saying uh, if you don't agree with this, you will fail the course. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying we will be giving you reasons from Scripture as to this position, the pre-tribulation rapture of the church, and a, what is referred to as the dispensational premillennialism. Now, if you want to hold on, hold to another position, you're perfectly fine as long as you know you are convinced and you see reason for it. That's fine. But we will be giving reasons here for this and explaining this why we take this position okay uh, and we'll come back to this figure from time to time as we talk about the very sequence of events that are going to uh, take place so like i said we're going to give room for variations that means yeah we're fine we understand there are people who might uh, see things differently and we're not going to fight about it uh, we will listen and we will also have an explanation to the reason uh, we take or, or for the position that we take and we will explain it the, the best we can right uh, number four the fourth approach uh, that we will um, talk about uh, in uh, in uh, in studying the end times is we try to look at a complete view of scripture so especially when when you're reading the book of revelation if you understand that hey other people have spoken about things daniel throughout his book you know daniel has said so much about the end times then zechariah has spoken and joel has spoken and so many others in the old testament have spoken and so if you want to understand the book of revelation it's always it's good to know you know what what has been written in other places in scripture and the apostle paul wrote you know first thessalonians and second thessalonians and corinthians the lord jesus spoke about it matthew 24 and so when you take all these and put them all together then we get a beautiful understanding of scripture right so in our on in our study of the end times we don't want to take one chapter in isolation or a few verses in isolation no everything has to be interpreted with the light of the rest of scripture what else does scripture say you know so along so put it all together and then interpret 
uh, number five, like I was saying, the Old Testament is explained in the New Testament. So there are many Old Testament prophecies, and as we progress, you know, through the New Testament, we begin to better understand what was spoken of, even in the Old Testament. And um, number six, um, um, uh, we will use biblical typology, and I think I've been explaining this all along, that when we are trying to interpret figurative language and prophecy, we will use the scriptures itself uh, to interpret that. And I, and I, and I mentioned the uh, example of uh, waters, mentioned in Revelation 17, verse 1 and verse 15. Right? Um, number seven, when we're interpreting scripture, we will recognize there are different time frames. That means, when a prophet is speaking, or when a prophet is writing, when there's a prophetic release of scripture, time frame, uh, you know, can can change within a given prophecy. Time time can change. So, uh, classic examples would be Isaiah chapter nine, verse six and seven. Where Isaiah says, you know, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder. And to the, you know, to his rule and reign, there will be no end to the increase of his government, there will be no end. So it is given to us as one verse, Isaiah, or as you know, one Isaiah nine, six, and seven. I'm just turning there in my Bible so I make sure I be quoted properly. Um, yeah, of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. So, so he says, Isaiah nine six, unto us a, a child is born, unto us a son is given. So that took place in Bethlehem two thousand years ago. In that same verse, he says, and the government will be upon his shoulder. That is yet to be fulfilled. That is out in the future. It will happen in Revelation 20, verse 4. It will happen when Christ comes and he sits and rules from Jerusalem. So within one verse, Isaiah 9, 6, in that one verse is a gap of more than 2,000 years. Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, that took place in Bethlehem, already fulfilled. The government will be upon his shoulder, that is still in the future. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end upon the throne of David and over his kingdom. That means he's going to sit on the throne of David, he's going to be ruling from Jerusalem, that is in the future. Right? So, in one single prophetic utterance, there is a time frame of more than 2,000 years. So, he's changing, he's, go, he's jumping across time in one sentence. This is happening, this is going to happen, this is going to happen. It's in one sentence, but in one sentence, he's jumping time more than 2,000 years. So, the jump could be forward, or the jump could be backward. For example, in Isaiah 65, 17 to 25, the jump is backward because he starts off by saying, there are new heavens and the new earth. And then he jumps backward 1,000 years and he's talking about the millennium, life in the millennium. He says, you know, um, a man and a child will live for 100 years and they will die only after 100 years. They will build houses and they will plant vineyards. Now, that is not happening in new heavens and the new earth. That's happening in the millennium. The lion will lie down with the, the lamb, and people will beat their swords into plowshares. That's the millennium. So in Isaiah 65, 17 to 25, he starts off by talking about the new heavens and the new earth, which is described for us in Revelation 21 and 22. But then he jumps back 1,000 years and starts talking about life in the millennium. 
Okay, so you have to recognize time frame. Okay, what's he talking about? And how can I understand time frame? Well, I have to interpret it in the light of the rest of scripture, right? That, oh yeah, the scripture is saying that the government, Jesus will sit upon the throne of David, but that's going to happen in the future, right? And, uh, uh, or things, you know, if we talk about the new heavens and new earth, yeah, it's going to happen in the future. Peter wrote about it, Second Peter 3, um, and the book of Revelation talks about it, and so therefore, I, I need to understand Isaiah's prophecy along with what Peter wrote and along with what John wrote in Revelation. Right? So then I understand that he's actually jumping back in time, 1,000 years, describing life in the millennium. And then, you know, so, like, so we understand that. Um, are you all with me so far? Uh, okay, let me just finish a few more points and then we will take time for questions. Number eight, our third guideline in uh, interpreting scripture is to recognize dual near and far fulfillment that means uh, uh, again in prophetic scripture sometimes there is the near and the immediate fulfillment and then there is the future fulfillment right so example uh, Ezekiel right um, when he's prophesying Ezekiel is prophesying. This is around the time when Israel was in captivity in Babylon. You know, we we know that they were in captivity for seventy years, and during Isaiah foretold that, Jeremiah announced it, and Ezekiel and Daniel lived through that. Right? Um, of course, Jeremiah lived through parts of it. Now, Ezekiel is prophesying about the regathering of Israel. So there is a near fulfillment, which means it happened then, that means at the end of the 70 years, the Jewish people were permitted to go back to their own land. So there was a near fulfillment. But there is also an end time fulfillment. So Israel, was regathered together as a nation, 1948. They became a nation, uh, official nation in their own land. So there is both a near and a distant, far fulfillment of the regathering of the nation. The reason this is significant is because then in Ezekiel 38, he starts prophesying about Russia. And he talks about how Russia the people from the land of Gog and Magog, we will explain this. They look at a nation that has settled in their own land. They're living peacefully and they say, I will go and attack them, which is a future fulfillment, you know, uh, Ezekiel 38, talking about how this kingdom from the north, referring to Russia, because if you look at Moscow, Moscow is directly north of Jerusalem in the map. And uh, Ezekiel prophesied, Ezekiel 38, he mentions the tribes which are actually part of Russia. And so he says, this people will look at this people who have been brought back to their own land or living peacefully in their own land. That was fulfilled in the sense that Israel was regathered as a nation. They became a nation uh, in 1948. And then you have, you're looking into the future on how the king from the north will attack Russia, um, will attack Israel. Okay. So there is a near fulfillment, which means in Ezekiel's time, the Jews were permitted to go back to their own nation. But there's a far fulfillment, meaning after more than 2,000 years, they were regathered. All the dispersed were, I mean, the dispersed, the nation that was dispersed, that didn't exist, was regathered as a nation. And they became a nation, 1948. And we have to look at their journey from then on. So understand there's a near and a far fulfillment in certain cases. Um, we also are open to uh, unexpected ways. That means, you know, right, we may not even realize, but 
God will set it up and cause the word of God to be fulfilled. So uh, how exactly it's going to happen, we will be open to it. For example, uh, Revelation 13 says that the antic, the beast, um, there is the beast, there is the false prophet, there is a second beast, there is the dragon. The dragon represents Satan, the beast represents um, the Antichrist, um, and there's a false prophet who, that means he's a leader who, who is, uh, who's become a religious leader. Now, they are working together. This is Revelation 13. They establish a financial system where nobody can buy or sell except they have the mark of the beast. And the mark of the beast is either on their forehead or on their hand, and the mark is 666. You cannot buy or sell unless you have this mark. So we don't know exactly how this is going to be fulfilled. You know, we have many possibilities. You know, uh, when credit cards, <laughs> when credit cards were being issued many, you know, some years ago, people thought, oh, credit card, look, you know, everybody's having a credit card. You cannot buy or sell unless you have the credit card. And so that's the mark of the beast. And then we, uh, then we said, no, 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 you know, then now you can have chip Im implants in your body. And maybe the chip implants will carry the mark of the beast, you know, they'll put it in your forehead or on your hand. And only then you can uh, buy and sell. Uh, then slowly it changed to, well, nowadays they can just look at your eye retina, you know, just facial recognition and look at your eye and they can identify you. And, and that is then connected to your bank accounts and you buy and sell through those kind of mechanisms. So, so uh, we don't know how it's going to exactly be fulfilled, but the Bible says that people are going to be engaging in a global financial system. They cannot buy or sell unless they have this mark. And there are many options today on how that could actually be fulfilled, many, many ways, you know. And so we just be open. We don't have to pick one way, you know, some something. There are so many ways in which that can throw Revelation 13 can actually be fulfilled today. But there are so many options. Just remain open. However it's going to happen, it's okay. okay. And number 10, we acknowledge that uh, our understanding of certain end-time prophecies is not 100% certain. You know, um, uh, it's not 100%, but we can do our best study, our best understanding, and then say that this is most likely. For example, uh, I'll just give you an example. The, you know, uh, Daniel, Daniel prophesied, and this is beautiful to see, you know, in, in Daniel um, uh, chapter 8, chapter 9, when you study Daniel, he prophesied, he talked about the coming world empires. So he talked about, uh, of course, he talked about the Babylonian empire, he talked about the Medes, he talked about the Persians, and then he spoke about the Greek Empire. So that was out in the future. You know, so Daniel was living at that time. You know, he lived during the Babylonian. He spoke ahead of time. He spoke about the next world empire. He prophesied about the Medes. He prophesied about the Persians. He also prophesied about the Greek Empire. Now, he never lived to see that. But we can read it and we can say, hey, it was fulfilled just the way Daniel prophesied. One of the things that happened was, Daniel said, the Greek, Greek Empire, the leader of that Greek Empire would be very young, very strong, very powerful. You can read this in Daniel 8, and we will look at it. We will look at it next year, but you know, I'm just giving a summary. And this young ruler will be very strong, very powerful. He will expand his kingdom, but suddenly he'll be cut off in his youth. He'll die young. 
And then his kingdom will be divided into four, four portions. There'll be four horns or four leaders who will take care of take over four portions of his kingdom. And from one of those four portions will come the Antichrist. So who was Daniel speaking of? He was speaking of Alexander the Great. He was the Greek leader who grew his empire very fast, very strong, but he died when he was very young. And when Alexander the Great died, his the Greek empire was taken over by four of his generals. So that big Greek empire was broken down into four portions and four of his emperors took over for so part of it was Syria, Greek, Greece, so modern country, Greece, Turkey, um, Egypt, Turkey. Right? Four of his uh, thing. It was broken down. And then he says, from one of these four will come the Antichrist. So when you look at that empire today, of course, it's very broad, very broadly speaking. I'm not saying very precise. You can say, okay, it was broken in these four areas, Greece, Syria, Turkey, Egypt. And then he points and says, from one of these four comes the Antichrist. So most likely from one of these four areas will come a leader who's going to be strong. And so we're not saying very definite, but based on what we read, uh, in Daniel's prophecies, based on what actually has taken place in history. Now remember, you know, when the Greek Empire was broken, when Alexander the Great, his, his empire was broken into four portions, they were rough, they covered rough parts of Europe and then into the Medi across the Mediterranean. So we're generally saying it could be from this, one of these areas where the Antichrist will come and so we we look okay this is what's happening daniel prophesied about it but we don't want to be very rigid because you know the greek empire covered a, a large uh, portion of there are many countries that are that that are part of the former empire so we have some idea based on what daniel spoke about but we're not 100 percent sure so we don't want to be very you know, hard and fast on that. So these are. This is an example where, okay, we are open. We understand what Daniel prophesied. We understand how it has been fulfilled, and we know where to look for. But we don't want to point our finger at some person and say he is or he could become the Antichrist. We don't want to do that. Okay. Uh, let me just make two points here, and then I'll take questions. Uh, so in all of our study of the end times. Um, we don't want some things that we don't subscribe to. For example, two things uh, would be, one is there is, uh, what to say, there is one position or there are two positions in, in this whole study of the end times, which we just don't agree with uh, because we see that it's not correct. Um, one is preterism. This belief is that uh, everything was already fulfilled in the first century. Okay, now that's kind of weird, but there is some teaching along those lines that everything was already fulfilled within the first hundred years. Now it is absurd. How can you know a thousand years be fulfilled within uh, the first hundred years and you know all of those things? But that's one person of obviously it's it's not it's absurd so we don't subscribe to it then there is another position which is prevalent today uh, it is often referred to as uh, dominion theology you may have heard about it or maybe it's not you know people don't speak about it too much but um, what this theology says is that the church must take over all the nations, control all the nations, and usher in the coming of Christ. So um, 
it puts the responsibility on the church to govern the nations. Well, actually, we don't I mean, we don't subscribe to it because it is actually Christ who's going to come and defeat the Antichrist. And Christ is going to give the kingdoms of the earth to the church to rule and govern. It's not the other way, right? It's very clear, Revelation 19, it's Christ who comes riding on the white horse who overthrows the Antichrist. And Daniel chapter 7 is very clear. It is he, Christ, who gives the nations to his saints to govern. Whereas Dominion theology puts it the other way. They say, we have to take over the world and then Christ will come and rule. No, the scriptures tell us differently. So that's why we don't subscribe to these two things. And, but you know, I just want you to be aware that uh, there are these kinds of uh, interpretations of end time scriptures. But for us, we just say, look, that's completely wrong. That's not what the Bible says. Okay. So let me pause here. I, I, I think it must be a lot of information for you today. Uh, are you all with me? You're, you're okay? You're following? Any questions? Uh, first, in the chart, uh, which we, uh, we saw a little earlier, uh, talking about the millennial uh, segmentation, uh, is there also a war of uh, Gog and Magog towards the end? Because uh, I, I'm not sure we saw mm. that in the chart. Yeah, so uh, we have not. Uh, so in the chart, we haven't put we haven't put uh, all the details that would happen. So um, there are two times Gog and Magog are referenced, and which we can position in the chart. One is towards the end of the seven-year tribulation. Another is towards the end of the millennium. To the end of the seven-year tribulation, that is Ezekiel chapter 38, where uh, the Gog and Magog from the north see a nation that is living at peace, and they say they're going, they're going to go and attack. Basically, Russia coming in to attack Israel. And then Ezekiel chapters 38 and 39, it says Rush, Israel will push Russia back. They'll be defeated. They'll be pushed back. Then they will regroup and they will come again. But this time they will be assisted by other Arab nations. And he mentions many of the Arab nations who will assist and they will all come against uh, Israel. So that's Ezekiel chapters. 38 and 39. So that's one time we have Gog and Magog, but that is positioned at the end of the tribulation, towards the end of the seven year tribulation, before the coming of Christ to establish his kingdom on the earth. The second time Gog and Magog is mentioned is at the end of the millennium, that is. Satan is bound for 1,000 years during the millennium. He is away from the planet. And at the end of the 1,000 years, he is released for a brief period of time. And this is Revelation chapter 20. And at that time, he goes and he deceives the nations once again. And it is stated there, that he is able to get Gog and Magog to join him. So this is again talking, you know, about a people whom Satan has deceived, and he will go against uh, the place. He will go against, you know, Christ Himself, who is ruling from Jerusalem. So that's the second time it's mentioned, but in a different context. It is mentioned in the context when Satan is released. At the end of the thousand years, given a brief chance to deceive the nation. So we see Gog and Magog mentioned twice. Now we haven't shown it in the chart because it's a finer detail, but um, 
hopefully that answers your question. Yeah. Yes, boss. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Any other any any uh, any other questions on on what we've covered so far? It's a lot of information, but uh, just feel free. Okay, I see Jeffina's comment. Yeah, that's a lot of information. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. So, what we I think we will pause here for today. Next week we will start off by um, just establishing that the Bible is a prophetic book, meaning we will look at some prophecies that were already fulfilled. And just to say that, look, the Bible has a very good track record where prophecies that were given were fulfilled. So, when we read prophecies about the future, we can have complete confidence that these things will be fulfilled. Because you look back, there's so many prophecies in the Bible that were fulfilled, just came to pass. When it seemed impossible, came to pass. Therefore, when we look at prophecy into the future, it may seem impossible, but everything God has spoken will be fulfilled. The only thing is for us to try to try to understand what has been given, what has been said, and uh, you know, um, and then we can look at what is happening in the world and connect it back to Scripture and say, "Oh yeah, this is what the Bible has already spoken, and these are the things that will happen." So we will establish that. Then we'll get into, after that, we'll get into a sequence of events, okay? Starting from where we are today, the church age, what is the sequence of events? And as we go along, we'll explain. You know, bit, we'll get into the details. Uh, we'll explain what is going to happen. Okay? Let's um, close in prayer. I don't want to overload you. Um, Take some time to just go back over the notes uh, and uh, just review it. Uh, feel free to ask questions, any doubts, just feel free. And uh, let's try to understand this subject very well. And uh, uh, once you, you, know, you study this, and then next year when we look at everything verse by verse, you'll find out that, uh, you'll find that it's, it's, it's quite, you know, it's all there, you can understand it. And the meaning is all there, um, and uh, it's not very difficult to understand uh, Bible prophecy. Okay, could somebody please close in prayer, and we will dismiss after that. Father, we pray that uh, we would be able to grasp everything what you have uh, written in your scriptures. And we would be able to understand it in its fullness. We pray, O oh God, that it would benefit our personal life and also um, our congregation that you have given us. We pray, O oh God, that we would prepare ourselves for your coming and understand your word better, Lord Jesus. Thank you for this class and thank you for Pastor sharing this word uh, in in depth to for us to understand God. We praise your holy name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, everyone. Have a good break and you can prepare for your next class. I'll see you again next week. Thank you. Bye now. Thank you, everyone. God bless you. See you again. Bye now. Thank you, Pastor.